this one I think um, is is um, kind of trying to bring multiple things together. We're going to be bringing neural nets together. We're going to be bringing a little bit of the hidden Markov models. We're trying to bring elements of um, um, the concepts that we introduced yesterday and and today into this uh, uh, near well epic. <laughs> Uh, effort to try and do um, gene identification for prokaryote systems. So this is module six of the machine learning course. Uh, as before, we have our Creative Commons license that tells you to share and share alike. The slides can be shared uh, with others and distributed freely. So the title for this module is Finding Genes with artificial neural networks and hidden Markov models. The reason why this is a fairly long module is because it's, and it's set for almost two hours here, um, is it includes both the lecture and the lab, uh, but it also tries to cover some of the problems or mistakes that can happen when people try and apply uh, one concept uh, too far. So as I say, if you've got a hammer, uh, everything looks like a nail and, and not everything is. Sometimes you need a screwdriver, sometimes you need a saw. And, and this is partly to illustrate the importance of feature engineering or feature selection in trying to develop good models. And I've mentioned this a few times before and I'll emphasize it today and again, other lectures and modules as well. You, You've got some, you know, a toolbox of very powerful equipment when you've got machine learning. You've got neural networks, you have Markov models, random forest decision trees. These are all very powerful computational tools. But if, if you don't have the right data, or if you haven't formatted the data, or if you haven't set up the right topology, or thought about it in a, in a comprehensive way, uh, you have the situation of garbage in and garbage out. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to show here today. So to understand how you can use machine learning for gene prediction, uh, we're going to focus on prokaryotic genes. These are simpler genes, simpler gene structure than eukaryotic genes. Um, the best uh, advances and some of the best utility or examples of machine learning have been applied in eukaryotic gene prediction. Um, but since this is an introductory course, um, and because prokaryotic genes are a little simpler, we're going to focus on prokaryotic gene prediction. So this is not going to win everyone the Nobel Prize or anything, but we're just going to, as an illustrative example, how you can use machine learning to predict genes in bacteria. And it's a general concept that could also be applied to many other things. Um, you just have to associate the relationships with your own problems. I'm going to talk about how uh, gene prediction has been traditionally done, how it's assessed, and then we're going to look at uh, some code uh, with different ways of predicting prokaryotic genes. And we're not really going to involve too much about the HMM, but then we're going to dive into using CoLab to, to look at the gene prediction code. So Genes are segments of DNA that typically code for proteins. There are some non-coding genes that produce um, messenger RNA, well, tRNA and rRNA. Um, and then there's non-coding uh, RNA that also is relevant for, for the function. And this is found in um, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, uh, all organisms. This is the genetic code, which essentially allows you to translate um, the different um, codons, uh, triplets of bases to the different amino acids. And you can see uh, this is in the RNA code, so we have U's instead of T's, uh, that there are some codons that are very abundant. Um, things like uh, the valine, leucine codons are quite abundant. Arginine, uh, curiously, is a very abundant codon, but it's a very rare amino acid. Um, and then there's the termination codons. There's three termination codons. Uh, then there's kind of the universal start codon, ATG or AUG, which is methionine. Um, and I guess I won't belabor it, but this, of course, um, 
is an important table when you're trying to identify genes. When we look at DNA, uh, we typically have uh, a forward strand and a reverse strand, so DNA is double-stranded. Uh, when we translate genes, we look through codons and we talk about reading frames. Uh, in the forward strand, there's reading frame one, two, and three. In the reverse strand, there's reading frame minus one, minus two, and minus three. So I'm showing double-stranded DNA, a segment here, and I'm showing the translation um, for reading frame one, two, and three. And you can see that ATG is methionine. Uh, you can see that CGT is arginine. We can see that TGC in frame two codes for cysteine and that the uh, reading frame GCG codes for alanine. Uh, we can see the same in the reverse and then I've got the arrows showing how these are read out. And then the stars um, represent uh, termination codons. So again, this is just for refreshing people's memories. In terms of prokaryotes, um, and gene structures are usually referred to as open reading frames. There's a start codon, and then there's any one of three stop codons, and that from start to stop is called a, an open reading frame. And then there's typically some kind of promoter um, upstream, anywhere from 50 to 200 base pairs up. Um, and those include the Shine Del Garno sequence, the Pribno box, and a variety of other um, sequences. Uh, I've marked off the different frames, reading frame one, two, and three, assuming that we're in the forward strand, just to remind people about um, frame structure. So you can kind of write up a really simple gene finding algorithm. And some of you maybe have even done this yourselves. You can write it in different languages. Um, and typically, if you've got a, you know, a four million base pair prokaryotic genome uh, sequence, you can start from base one, and you can start scanning forward, uh, looking for ATG, which is the start codon. Once you've found that ATG, then you scan things in, in groups of three in that same reading frame until you find one of the three stop codons. And then you can use some kind of rule and say, based on the number of bases or based on the number of codons, um, am I far enough away from the start to say that this is actually a gene? So if you find you know, five bases, six bases later, uh, here's your stop codon. Um, that's probably too short. Um, so some people will use a cutoff that you have to have at least 50 uh, codons. Some people use a cutoff of just 50 bases uh, to being a gene. Um, if it's, um, uh, if you have found a, a gene, uh, then you can go back and, and then start um, looking for another start codon um, and then scanning forward to look for stop codons. If it's um, less than 50, um, then you can go back and start looking for another um, uh, gene to start over again. So you, you do this repeatedly uh, for the, the forward frame, and then you look at the reverse complement or the reverse strand and um, uh, calculate the genes for the reverse um, or backward strand. And so both strands uh, can code for genes. And by looking at both strands, you can identify um, several thousand genes. A genome of about 4 million bases uh, will have about 4,000 genes typically in, in a prokaryotic genome. There are web servers. Um, NCBI has one called OrfFinder. Um, it's been around for many years. You can uh, paste in an entire genome, and then just it will find all of your open reading frames. You can see this in the six different reading frames. It shows the direction of the genes, it shows the length, you can click on them. Uh, it tells you whether it's in the positive or the negative or forward or reverse strand, it tells you what reading frame, it tells you the start and stop, it tells you the, the length in bases and the length in the amino acids. You can get the sequences. You can do blast uh, to see if these things match anything. What you can see from this diagram is that the coding density is pretty high and that you have a number of cases where genes seem to be overlapping or nested um, all on top of each other. This is not reality. Um, this is not how dense the genes are uh, in prokaryotes. They are modestly dense, uh, but not to the point where you've got uh, genes upon genes upon genes. 
So this is what a simple ORF finder will do. Uh, it finds lots of possible genes and it has many, many, many false positives. So when we talk about gene prediction, uh, whether it's in eukaryotic, prokaryotic uh, systems, we can talk about it either at the gene level uh, or at the base level. Um, this is illustrating the performance of a gene predictor or gene identifier at the base level. So uh, how many bases off are you from the right stop or the right start codon? So uh, if we've got in, in light blue is the actual gene position. Um, so we've got a gene, then non-coding, then gene, then non-coding. And then in red, we have our prediction. So uh, in the red marks the coding region, the black lines mark the non-coding regions. And we can see that in the first gene, our prediction is a little too long. It's, it's right at the first codon, but it's wrong in the last codon. And so for whatever reason, our gene is too long. In our second gene, uh, we see that it's, it's too short. It starts at the wrong place and it ends in the wrong place, but it's in the right reading frame and, and at least it covers part of it. So in this way, we can think of gene prediction as a combination of true positives, that's the TP, the blue match is the red, false positives, where the red uh, is over predicting and it matches the, the black line, true negatives, so we're saying there's non-coding regions, and there's the false negatives, where we're saying that there isn't a gene uh, or coding region here. We say it's non-coding, when in fact it, it is really coding. So when you have true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, you can calculate sensitivity and specificity. This is the same thing as the confusion matrix. Um, we can also calculate things like precision. We can also calculate correlation, combined sensitivity and specificity. So these measures can all be used to report the performance of a gene predictor. Um, and remember sensitivity is a false uh, positive rate, specificity is the false negative rate. So here's the formulas for sensitivity and specificity. There's also the formula for precision. Uh, I'm not gonna give the formula for correlation because it's really, really complicated. But these are all used when people report performance of gene prediction, both for eukaryote and prokaryote. And this is done for, uh, as I say, the base level. We could also do this at the gene level. And in this case, I wouldn't be drawing lines here. Um, what we technically would happen is that um, the predictions in this case were all wrong. Uh, so even though maybe, um, let's say 500 out of the thousand bases are correctly predicted, because we never got the exact correct start and end codons, the red predictions at the gene level are all wrong. Um, so at the base level, we're probably, I don't know, 60% right, 70% right, but at the gene level, we're 0% correct. So depending on the level of what you're evaluating, uh, whether it's the gene or base level, you can sort of artificially inflate your performance. Most people in the world of molecular biology report at the base level because it gives them better numbers. Um, if you report it at the gene level, um, we actually do pretty miserably when it comes to gene prediction. Um, so how do you find open reading frames? Typically there are start codons. The most common is ATG. In many bacteria, they have sort of alternate start codons that are about maybe found in 1% or 2% of the cases. Uh, two of the most common ones are GTG and TTG. And then there's some pretty universal stop codons, TAA, TAG, and TGA. Um, so if we're gonna try and find open reading frames, we can use the same algorithm. Um, we're gonna look for the start and stop, and we're gonna make sure that things are in the same um, reading frame. So this is a bit of an animation where we've got a start codon, and then we can find, as we move along, we're finding uh, combinations of starts and stops. And we're locating the indices of all of these start and stop codons. So this is a slightly different algorithm um, than what I described before, but it's, it's one that's mathematically a little faster uh, or computationally a little faster. Um, and so as we scan through this sequence of about 40 bases, uh, we've identified the stop and start codons. Um, so there's, I think, three stops and four start codons in this sequence. 
And based on their position, uh, we can identify whether they're in, in frame or out of frame and which ones might correlate that. So by finding all of the starts and stops, um, we can essentially um, identify possible genes. And this is looking at the forward strand and then also the reverse strand or the reverse complement. And uh, this is an example from actually, I guess, E. coli, where we're identifying the start and stop. Uh, we found one that went from 337 to 2799. That actually turned out to be a real gene. But we also found sort of a nested gene from 567 to 780. That's not a real gene. We found another one between 798 and 915. That's not a real gene. But then we found another one that is immediately after 2799. It started at 2801 and went to 3733. That's a real gene. That's in the forward strand. Then we looked at the reverse complement or the reverse strand. And, and again, you can see where they were identified. Um, some overlapped, some didn't, some were long, some were short. Um, but on, on average, you're seeing that at the gene level, we're finding a lot of false positives. So we're just going to take an example where we're, we're going to use Python to program an ORF finder. This is not machine learning. This is just Python. Um, and we do have the Python code for it. Again, it's, it's not machine learning. It's in module six. Um, and it's just called ORF finder. The general algorithm is, is simple. It reads the data. It verifies the data, just checking to see if there's any missing data. Then we create a codon function that just essentially identifies start and stop codons. Uh, and then we look at all the start and stop codon lists um, that are in the different uh, three reading frames. And we identify start stop codon pairs that are in the same reading frame. Um, we then create an ORF function, uh, which then analyzes those lists and looks for a separation. In this case, we're finding out that the ORFs have to be at least 40 bases. This is quite short, but it turns out um, there's about a dozen of these in, in the average bacterium with very short open reading frames. Um, we also um, encode uh, another check to identify start codons with up to three stop codons in the same reading frame uh, just to avoid um, truncating some of the genes. And again, this is learning by experience. Um, so we combine the codons and the ORF functions together to create the ORF finder function, and then we just run it. And then we calculate the correct and incorrect ORFs where we're using the correct ORFs that were tabulated by NCBI. In this case, we're analyzing um, E. coli uh, genome. So if we're running the program, uh, we have to import NumPy and Pandas as we normally do. If we're reading the data set, uh, we're looking at both the forward and reverse complement sequence. And these are all fast A uh, formats and replacing certain uh, backslash next line characters just to keep the, the data simple. Um, we're doing the missing data check to see if there's something um, not there. So we usually have that in the, these programs. Here's the codons function. Uh, we're just identifying the stop codons here. Uh, and we're going to create a list of the start, which is in this case ATG, and um, the stop ones, which are the TA, TGA, and TAG. And we keep track of our counters. Uh, we're going to look at three different rating frames. We start from, you know, 0, 1, 2, uh, which gives us 3. Uh, so we don't start at 1, 2, 3. We start at 0. Uh, we look at the first codon, see if it's a start codon, add it to a start codon list, look to see if it's a stop codon, add it to the stop codon list, and then keep track of the reading frame. Uh, I've talked about some of the alternate start codons. Um, ATG, DTD, and TTG are the more common ones. The other class 2A ones are really rare, so we're not going to consider them. Um, so once we found start codons, then we're pairing the stop codons, and, and that allows us to form an ORF. Um, so this sort of showing frame one, here's the list of start codons in green, and then frame one, the list of stop codons in red. And you can see the frame one, uh, we found stop codons at positions 13, 46, 61, 64, and 112. All of those are less than 190. So therefore, the only viable stop codon is one at 253, because that's greater than 190. So we can pair 190 to 253 and say, though, that's a, a viable or potential ORF. 
So um, we have the ORF um, tool uh, where we create the valid ORF start and stop. We check, check for a minimum length, uh, and then we determine the frame of the start codons from that. Um, that continues, and it's just also dealing with situations if we have um, any additional stop codons, perhaps getting the right start codon, but the wrong stop codon. So this makes sure that we're able to at least include um, if the gene's too short, then at least we found one or two or three uh, that are possible ones where there's possibly a skipping step that goes on. Um, then uh, we've put all of these components together um, to essentially uh, create the full or finding function that gets the start and stop and also does all the comparisons between the correct and incorrect uh, codons that we had uh, or ORFs in this particular calculation. So as I say, this is not machine learning. This is just a Python program for identifying ORFs. And it's not too different than the one that um, I showed earlier with the NCBI ORF finder. Um, almost identical in terms of its uh, coding. It doesn't have the nice graphical interface. So what we did was we analyzed uh, E. coli. E. coli is probably the best studied bacterial genome. There's about 4,400 known genes, give or take about 10. And the overall length for uh, the E. coli genome is about 4.6 million bases. Um, so we took the data um, and ran it through. So all 4.6 million bases, ran it through the program and identified the start and stop codons and both the correct ones and the incorrect ones. Um, so using this algorithm, uh, we were able to correctly predict 4,282, 4,282 out of the 4,407, uh, which is about 91% correct. Um, but we also predicted uh, about 1.63 million other genes. Um, which uh, is insane, but that's an example of how a naive or finder um, can seriously over predict. So, you know, we maximized our uh, correct predictions, the true positives, but at the expense of predicting, um, I guess it's 400 times more um, other genes. And so, this is essentially the problem with ORF finders. They produce lots of false positives, so many false positives that they're almost useless. And so this is sort of showing in this um, um, uh, truth table or confusion matrix. So this is, if you want, the baseline. This is about as bad as you can get in terms of overprediction, but it's also about as good as you can get in terms of finding ORFs uh, using the concept that there's a start codon and a stop codon and that there's you know, three, poss or two, three possible start codons and three possible stop codons. Um, so 91% um, um, is, is okay, but we obviously wanna get rid of the 1.6 million uh, over predictions. So this is where neural nets can come to the rescue. Uh, or at least naively, this is where we thought. And we said, look, um, ORF predictions um, are kind of um, pattern analysis. Machine learning is a good tool. Uh, neural nets are probably the best ones. We should be able to use neural nets just like we did for secondary structure to identify genes. So we're gonna take our, define our problem, follow through the standard six steps. And here is how do we find the prokaryotic genes from large genome sequence. So the rationale, as I said, was to use um, neural nets, artificial neural nets. And as you guys saw yesterday, we can take a sequence, in this case, amino acids, and we can predict the appearance and the currents of helices, coils, and beta strands. And the program we, we produced was able to get around 61, 62% correct. Um, technically with genes, thinking would be it's simpler. Um, DNA, there's just four bases, not 20 amino acids. And instead of helix, coil, and beta sheet, there's just coding and non-coding. 
the non-coding is the gene, um, um, or the coding is the gene, the non-coding is, is essentially empty sequence where there's nothing there. Um, so we can structure our problem almost identically to the secondary structure prediction one. Um, so when we can find our training and testing data, so uh, in this case, as we found out from the ORF finder that I talked about earlier, we can use the 4.4 million bases, the correct gene locations that have been tabulated um, through many years of study, uh, both in the forward and the reverse strand. And we can use the same concepts that we had and talked about last time in terms of neural nets. We can take segments of, you know, uh, 17 bases at a time instead of 17 amino acids, a window. Uh, we can do the standard hot one hot encoding where we convert A's and T's and G's to these numbers. Um, we can convert coding to non-coding. So our outputs are sort of simple again through one hot encoding. Then we can take our uh, sliding window um, and move it around from, you know, in this case, I'm just using window three, but we can put out uh, a window of 17, 50, whatever we want. And our input vector is one, our output vector is another. Um, again, this is the example where we're, we've got the sequence that we've put in, we've one hot encoded it. Um, so T is 0, 1, 0, G is 1, 0, 0, and A is 0, 0, 1. We have our weight matrices that are initially randomized. We do our matrix calculation um, and we calculate our final output. And we wanted a, an output of 0, 1. Our initial one is actually 0.24 and 0.74. So we do back propagation, modify things as we talked about last time. And we back propagate through layer one and layer two. Um, and then we input uh, either another vector or retrain it in another epoch. And now instead of getting, you know, it was 0.24 and 0.76, now we get 0.16 and 0.91. And if after many trials, that's about as low as we can go, we can say we've converged. Um, we can train in a second input, um, compare, uh, see how well that does, iterate, back propagate, go through more training rounds. Uh, and eventually we have our, you know, generalized training matrices, which are then useful for calculating um, any other gene or gene prediction. So conceptually, same thing as we did for secondary structure, but just with um, a different uh, alphabet and different one hot encoding. So uh, we construct our data set. Now we're gonna do transformation and feature selection. Um, so in this case, this is our encoding. Um, so the one I gave before, we just had three bases. Now we have four. So you can see how A's, C's, G's, and T's are encoded. And you can see how we've encoded um, C's and N's. Um, in this case, we didn't have to have zero, one. We could just have zero and one. So this is the, the encoding that we're doing. Uh, we're not going to use the null um, amino acid uh, concept. And this is because we're dealing with um, a genome that's 4.5 million bases. So I really don't care if we're off by 10 um, or 15. Whereas if we're looking at a protein that maybe has 200 protein, 200 amino acids, um, being off by even just a few residues is going to mess you up. So this is just a simplification. It means we're going to slightly mess up our prediction for about 0.001% of the whole genome, which is pretty small. Um, so we're going to have a, just like with our genome or with our secondary structure, we're going to have a window. This is a small window. Um, and um, if this is, what is it? I think 11 bases. So we predict the sixth base and say the middle base um, corresponding to the bold G corresponds to a bold C, which is a coding region. So as we slide the window along, we say coding, 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 until we see a transition to non-coding. Uh, as I say, we're not using the null window, so we're just sliding along. No predictions are going to be made for the first few nucleotides, but out of 4 million to miss 10 is, is trivial. So it's just a simplification. Um, here's an example where we've got a window of 17, uh, and now this is not amino acids, but it's bases, and you can see how these are coded. Um, 
with the encoding function that we had. We're going to do the same flattening. Um, so if we have uh, four bits instead of the 21 that we had for amino acids, uh, and they've got a, a window of 17, then we'd have a, a flattened one of 68 bits um, for each um, position along the genome. And we can shift this so we can move it down. So that, again, this is almost an exact analogy to what we did for our secondary structure. And you could use essentially the same code uh, for the secondary structure. Um, we also um, converted the genome data that we got from the prokaryotic um, data in NCBI uh, to mark uh, coding and non-coding. So we took the 4.4 million bases in E. coli and uh, put in ones and zeros uh, to match the positions of all the genes because that's our, our, our output. Uh, we're going to do a training set of 70% and a test set of 30%, 4.6 million bases. Um, so that translates to 3.2 million training uh, samples and 1.3 million test samples. So lots of training data, which is great. Um, and then we have associated coding bits. We have our window sizes. Uh, so it could be up to 68 bits or larger or smaller. And our output, which is written on the, on the right side of this table. So again, if you understood a little bit about the secondary structure prediction ANN, this is almost identical. Um, we're just using a slightly different uh, encoding. So um, this program, uh, we'll call it um, a simple ANN, um, GSANN. We can write the program. As I say, you can pretty much copy um, the secondary structure ANN uh, and start coding just as we did. Uh, we put in the same functions. We import the gene position data um, that we, we've got so that we know which one's right, which one's wrong. Uh, we're going to create, read both the forward and reverse strands, the same reading sequence that we had for the ORF finder. And then, as I said, it's basically uh, the rest of it's the secondary structure uh, program that we developed in module four with just some minor tweaks. So how do we do? So we looked at different window sizes. So we went up to a window size of 17, then we started shrinking the window size down to seven bases and then nine bases. And um, the, these are the confusion matrices. Um, and um, certainly the window size of nine does better than the window size of seven. Uh, going up to 11, going down to, or up to 17 or down to five, didn't improve. So window size nine turned out to be the best. Um, and it, it's not great. Um, again, what you want to see with a confusion matrix is along the diagonal, uh, predicting an actual of being you know, 0.99 or one and predicted non-coding and actual non-coding. You also want to see around 0.99. Here we're seeing that we're only about uh, on average, I don't know, 60%, 50% correct, and that we um, mess up with false positives and false negatives uh, fairly badly, probably around um, 40, 45% of the time. So kind of like the hidden Markov model, uh, which we presented in, in section module five, this one is also disappointing. Um, and it's basically saying um, that um, you can't simply translate what you thought was a good model or worked for secondary structure to gene prediction. Uh, what we found is that uh, because the windows sizes were relatively modest and because there wasn't enough information in these windows, um, it caused not the typical output. So if this is the sequence down at the bottom here, we would have thought that we would see you know, clusters of Ns, non-coding, clusters of Cs for coding, followed by another cluster of Ns. What we actually saw was just this variation of Nc, Nnnc, Nc, so that there is no coherence. Um, so this looks like it would be good for a, um, maybe a protein production, secondary production, but secondary structure prediction, but this is not what you wanted to see. 
So it caused the flip-flopping of the output. So it didn't really give very useful gene predictions. So at the gene level, it was even worse than what I show here. So this is at the base level. At the gene level, we're probably about 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and the rest is pretty abysmal. So overall, um, this, this was a disappointment. Um, that, and I, I think the lesson is that simply naively applying, um, say, a neural net or a concept that worked for one to another doesn't work. And so what we needed to do uh, was rethink how we could use the neural net and rethink which features we should be looking for. And this is what I've been emphasizing not only in the last lecture, but I think throughout yesterday as well, that to really use machine learning well, you have to know a little bit about the problem and be aware of the things that um, help or enhance um, the performance. You need to understand the problem. You need to read through the literature and you need to be aware of the things that other people have suggested or thought of. Um, this is the essence of supervised learning. You are the supervisor. You are the one that's deciding what I'm going to expose my learner to and what are the pieces of information that are relevant and which ones aren't. You also have to make the decision about how do I train it? What, what ways do I train it? And it's a similar situation with the hidden Markov story so said, you know, how do you design the topology? How do you choose um, how many hidden nodes you're going to have and uh, how, how they're connected? That's up to you and it's often um, requires a fair bit of thinking and, and uh, intelligence. So what we thought about is we looked at the problem and said, okay, we've done really badly. What, how to improve it? So um, this is where we actually started reading the literature about gene prediction. And we realized that we needed to include more than just start stop codons. Uh, we also wanted to include alternate start codons. And we wanted to include codon frequency information. Some of you might remember or know that there's a preference, a bias um, for um, codons um, in coding regions and in non-coding regions. There's a first base preference, a second base preference. Um, and um, if you're designing genes, if you've ever had to do that, you have um, you know, base preferences and codon preferences that you're told about to enhance the expression. Um, there's also, people noticed even back in the 1980s or late 70s that there is a, a tendency for triplets or doublets of codons or hexamers, three bases also um, tend to be biased uh, between coding and non-coding region and between promoters and terminator regions. Um, we also wanted to include information on the uh, Pribno box, the shine delgarno sequence. And ideally those are sequences that we could identify through hidden Markov models. Although in this example, we just actually used uh, position-specific scoring matrices, uh, partly because it was a little faster. And at the time, we hadn't finished um, the hidden Markov model when we were putting this in. So, um, so this is the additional data that we felt would actually help improve it. So this is, if you want, feature engineering. It's looking through the literature and saying, what else have other people found to be useful features for making the prediction? And naively, we could have just said, all we need to know is the sequence and the start and stop code and we're done. Um, but um, that's obviously not sufficient. We saw pretty poor performance. Um, and so um, that's what we started doing. So this is just sort of a, a review about the uh, Pribno box, the minus 35, minus 10 region that we talked about in module five. The shine delgarno sequence, um, which is a ribosome binding site, and it has a characteristic pattern of um, bases and positions. And this is something that can be encoded through either a hidden Markov model or through a position-specific scoring matrix. There's certain features about uh, termination loops that are found in bacteria, um, this pairing stem loop structure where you look for a stretch of six or seven complementary bases um, um, to find or scan for that. Um, this is another way of terminating a gene. So that 
led us to, as I say, to, to think about um, how we do feature engineering, how we do feature extraction. Um, and it's essentially a way of using standard statistical methods to describe the data, to intelligently select what data we want, um, to use the literature, to use our knowledge, our experience, or the experience of others. Um, what it also does is that instead of just dealing with raw sequence, um, which is just, you know, bases that are, um, you know, collections of things, we can convert, you know, hundreds of bases into a few features. So it collapses the sequence um, instead of being, you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of bases long to um, half a dozen features. So this is almost a scaling that's happened. So we've got our raw sequence that, as I say, represents thousands to millions of bases. And now all we've converted the thousands of bases to is five features or six features or whatever we have. So this actually helps a lot. Um, it, it sort of reduces the data size. It speeds things up. I should comment that the, you know, the, the gene predictor that we used, a uh, simple one with the neural network, took forever um, because it was dealing with so many features and training for so long. Uh, because we're working with millions of bases. Um, but by extracting features um, from the sequence, we've actually collapsed it into uh, a very small little vector. And that's, that's great. So some of the things that we did was we started looking at um, codon usage frequency. And this is just a plot um, of the you know, 64 codons that are known and how frequently they're used, how frequently they're seen, serine, arginine. So, you know, only two arginine codons are basically used. Only one leucine codon is frequently used. Um, there's only two out of the three stop codons that are frequently used. These are all things that are, have been noted and detected um, in bacteria. And it, it may vary for certain classes of bacteria, um, more at the class or order level, but for the same species um, or genus, this codon preference seems to hold pretty, pretty strongly. So we can code and identify um, the codon usage frequency. We can look at uh, the percentage and uh, how frequently they're used, which ones are most frequently used. We can calculate the fractions of um, ones that are in the first position in, in, of A's. Uh, and we can calculate that occurrence. So in the end, um, codon usage frequency can be converted um, to just a vector of 12 numbers. Um, and that was done. So we were able to, to take um, all of that information, all those plots for the 64 known codons and, and essentially convert it into a, a, a frequency usage um, codon set, which is Again, it's not thousands of bases long, it's not millions of bases long, it's just 12 pieces of information uh, that we can calculate. Um, and this is converted for every um, uh, potential um, codon uh, or every potential gene or ORF that we would see. So we've converted, if the ORF has been identified as 1500 bases, it's, it's now 12 units. We can also go a little further, and this is not our idea, but this is something that um, other smart people had figured out. So again, this is using the literature. Um, we can uh, convert some of this information into an entropy. And this goes back to the Shannon entropy formula that we introduced yesterday um, with you know, uh, P log P. Um, in this case, we can sum over 12 instances and we can come up with a total. So instead of the 12 numbers, we can come up with a single number for that uh, entropy. And then we can convert that entropy into what's called a gamma value. Um, so that's just a, a reference to, in this case, the log 12 is the top 12 units. Um, and so um, now we can convert the gamma um, from um, the, I guess the original value that we had back here, 0.24 and so on, all the way through to this number, 0.12. Uh, 
the next thing that we can do uh, beyond the codon frequency statistics is to get um, the hexamer statistics. So it turns out that there's 4,096 hexamers. Um, so that's 64 squared. Um, so 64 codons is three. Um, 64 squared gives us 4,096. Uh, we can look at the information that we have already for other prokaryotic genomes, um, looking at promoters and terminators, ORFs, non-coding. And we can calculate things in sort of a log odds or log ratio term. So again, this keeps the numbers. It's a scaling trick. Um, and remember, I talked about scaling and normalization. So this is one of the things that we're, we're doing here. Um, so that was the same thing with the entropy value. It was another scaling trick. Um, and in this case, high values indicate higher usage in coding. So ATTAGC, that codon has mostly negative numbers or small numbers. So it's not very widely used in promoters or terminators. On the other hand, TAA, AAA, that particular hexamer is widely used in promoters and terminators. Um, so this can be calculated for all 4,096 um, codons from existing data um, on prokaryotic uh, genes. Um, so we can look at the hexamers, we can calculate them for ORFs, we can calculate them in promoter regions, we can calculate them in terminator regions. And again, this is data that we can get from you know, other sources. Um, so we're creating feature sets. Um, the other thing that we mentioned is trying to get um, promoters. So we could have used the hidden Markov model. At the time when we put this together, we didn't have a, a good working one. So we just used a position specific scoring matrix. And because promoters have different gaps between the minus 35 and the minus 10 region, some of them are 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And because possums don't handle gaps, uh, we had to create five different possums to deal with the different gaps um, to find these particular uh, promoter regions. Um, and we can convert them to log odds ratios um, and then identify the score. And generally, the, the lowest score um, wins with, with possum. So the one with the 18 space has the lowest score at 4.97. So that's the, the winning promoter. Um, and so we can also identify the location as we scan along certain regions and, and map out where the lowest score is and what position that lowest score is and what the position box is. So again, this is a set of features that we can calculate uh, throughout the entire genome. We can do the same thing with a sort of a possum uh, for the Shine Delgarno sequence. So created a possum for that. And we can scan along that, um, looking for it and seeing if there's a, a strong Shine Delgarno sequence um, in the region. So the codon usage uh, is 12 features. Hexamer scoring, we converted it to three features. The Pribno box possum, we converted that to 10 features. The Shine Delgarno possum, we converted that to seven features. So um, out of the, if we recall that we have this ORF finder, which identifies you know, 1.6 million ORFs, uh, of which 4,200 uh, are true ORFs and the other 1.6 million are, are not ORFs. So we, we use the old code that I described earlier to, to find any possible ORF. And then we take all of those 1.6 million ORFs and we convert those ORFs into these features of 12, 3, 10, and 7. So that's what 32 features. So those 32 features for each ORF um, are put in as inputs to the uh, artificial neural net. And the neural net is going to make the call of is this entire ORF of you know, a thousand bases say, is it coding or non-coding? So I just want to make sure people are clear on that. So we're using the old code that I introduced to you, which is the ORF finder. It's not machine learning. It's naive. It just finds start and stop codons. It over predicted by 1.6 million, uh, the number of ORFs. 
And so we're now invoking our artificial neural net to clean it up. And to do this, we're just taking the ORF features, not their sequence, but we, we analyze, we extract features from each ORF, including the codon frequency, the hexamer statistics, the Prevno box presence uh, around the ORF, uh, and the Shine Delgarno sequence present around the ORF. And uh, we run it through the neural net. So now, instead of having GSAN, uh, which was this, this sort of the simple neural net, we're now using the feature neural net, uh, and we're calling it GPAN. So this one uh, actually does exist, uh, whereas the GSAN we deleted because it was so bad. Um, so you can find the code in there. Uh, and what you'll see for this code is that it has um, same structure. Uh, for the first half of it, uh, which is just the OR finder. Um, so that's up to about um, this line here. So this identifies all the ORFs, it gets the 1.6 million. In, and then we call in uh, the next part, which is to calculate codon usage frequency, calculating the entropy parameter for gamma. We do the hexamer scoring and counting with these um, functions here. Uh, then we run the possum scoring functions on the promoter region or the Privno box, and the Shine Delgarno scoring function is also called. And then we take all of those calculated uh, parameters and then feed them into a neural net with 32 inputs, uh, five hidden units, and then the output as a yes, no, coding, no encoding. So if you look at the code, you'll see that we import NumPy and Pandas as we normally do. We import all the gene position data because we want to evaluate it. So that's reading it. So this is the, the truth table, if you want. Uh, we import the sequence just as we did with the um, genome uh, or, or finder that, that I described earlier. So this is stuff you've seen before, the checking the missing data, label values. This is the same code again from the OR finder where we're using start and stop codons uh, that we're making sure that we're in the right reading frames and check all, all three reading frames again, the OR finder. Same code as before, two lists are created. We have a minimum length of 40 bases. Uh, we look for possible stop codons. This generates all of the, the necessary uh, ORF data. So now we can start um, from here, which is determining the codon frequency position all the way to the neural net. So the codon frequency uh, calculation. Um, so we have to uh, identify uh, how many of, are, of these are found. We look and break them out. Um, we look at the, the range, make sure that we've got all of them marked up. Uh, from there, we count um, um, the frequencies of A's and C's and G's and T's in those codons. Um, we calculate um, the entropy. We calculate the gamma. So you can see the H is the entropy here. Gamma is one minus H over H naught. And then we produce that into a, a vector, um, uh, which is used for um, the calculation. Next, after we've done the uh, entropy and codon frequency, we have to do the hexamer calculations. Um, so we're calculating the, the numbers of, of each of the 4,096 hexamers, possible hexamers. Um, and we're calculating it not only over the coding regions, uh, but also in the promoter and terminator regions. Um, so this is a function to calculate hexamers. This is the function to uh, assign a score based on its frequency uh, in both coding and the non-coding DNA. So we've got uh, code and frequency information that it's looking up. Um, we're also tracking for some non-coding ones, some prior information that's um, in, in the tables that we collected. After we've got the codon frequency, uh, score is calculated at uh, the code and frequency and hexamer frequency. Then we're looking at the promoters. This is the Pribno box and the um, Shine Delgarno sequence. 
Um, so we're looking at the, the possums. And so these are the possums that were previously created. Um, and then we're used to score um, each of the uh, sequences uh, in and around the promoter regions that we'd identified. So this is just simply looking and calculating um, possum scores. Same sort of thing uh, that was done for the shine, um, for the Primna box we're doing for the shine Delgano. We're looking for this consensus sequence, but we're also looking through some, well, all possible variations, uh, 4,096 hexamers. Um, and the shine Delgano score then calculates those things through a, a sequence region uh, in the promoter region to make sure that we find that and to score those and identify how, how good they are. So these, these are Python routines. They're intended to extract the features, evaluate the features, produce some numbers. And each of them is producing you know, a certain quota of numbers. The codon frequency gives us 12, the axomer gives us uh, whatever it was, um, Shine Delgarno, um, promoter, Privno promoter, total is 32. So they've got 32 inputs and we decided that we're gonna use our neural net to do the discrimination, to make the decisions. So 32 features for each of the 1.6 million codons. Um, and then those are put into a hidden layer, which has five units. And then the output is a single uh, yes, no, zero coding, one non-coding. Um, so that's the architecture. Um, why we chose five, uh, it was just optimization as we tried different numbers of, of hidden units and that seemed to give the best answer. So this is a big program. It's almost a thousand lines. Um, it takes a while for it to extract the features, about 70 seconds um, to perform and run. It's about a little over a minute. Um, so it's, as I say, two parts. One is ORF identification, non-machine learning. Second part um, is actually the feature extraction. And then I guess really the third part is the neural net. Um, so all three combined to produce this 800, 900 line program. Um, so you know, it was trained on a training set of, of about, what was it, 3 million ORFs and then tested on about 1 million, um, um, well, I, I should say, how did we divide up? So 1.6 million ORFs, so 70% of them um, were, were not useful. But anyways, 70-30 um, split, we took 30 and tested them and then um, we assessed it. So um, using just um, information about um, some of the start and stop codons, and I think it was just um, um, the data alone about um, our hexamer statistics, I believe we got up to 91%. Um, if, you know, so this is the one where um, it was a simple or finder, so so it was 91% for finding the 4,200 out of the 4,400 genes, but then the 1.6 million um, over prediction um, is what we got uh, in terms of the false positives. So um, bad performance in this direction, good performance in this direction. The GSAN, where we use a nine base window, gave us a 40% prediction for correct genes, 73% for non-correct genes, but still not a great performance in terms of false positives and false negatives. So that was the GSAN. If we just use the codon frequency statistics using the feature performance uh, or GPAN method uh, instead of GSAN or the simple neural net, or the simple ORF finder, you get a really dramatic change. So 92% correct genes, 91% uh, non-coding genes, and only a seven to 9% error. So let's just go back here. Here we're seeing 60%, 27%, only 40 and 73. And then with a really naive one, it was 91% here, but 
99.999% here and 0.9% there or 9% there. So this alone should show you that, that changing your format uh, and the model where we're now saying let's not just simply use it as a secondary structure prediction tool, but one where we're now taking uh, features and combining them and, and doing it in an intelligent way or using feature selection and feature engineering, um, a profound improvement. Um, in fact, this alone is about as good as the best uh, genome predictors can get. And it's just using code and frequency statistics. So then we ran the program where we use the hexamer statistics and things improved slightly. So 922 to 923, uh, 911 to 917, um, number of false positives also slightly reduced uh, here. So codon frequency, hexamer statistics help. Then if we include promoter information, um, then again, uh, we're almost up to 93%. This is above 92, and these things have now dropped to around 7%. Um, we tried a little bit with uh, the HMM model um, off and on. It made slight improvements, but nothing really to um, shout about. So although we had hoped the HMM would actually have helped more than it did, um, it, it didn't make that much of a difference in terms of promoter prediction. Um, but again, overall, I just want to emphasize that we went from a really awful performance in terms of over predicting by millions and millions of base of, of uh, ORFs to one where uh, we're hovering around 90, 93 and 92% in terms of prediction of the correct ORFs and only having around a 7% error of, of incorrect ORFs. And um, as I say, that actually makes this particular algorithm, at least version three, uh, about as good as any uh, ORF, prokaryotic ORF predictor there is. Um, so I, I, again, the, the point is that doing proper reading, um, proper feature engineering um, makes a huge difference. And, um, code on frequency information, there have been papers written about it, there's long discussions, the idea of using entropy to calculate it. These were not our ideas, this is what was in the literature. Uh, using hexamer statistics, again, someone smart came up with the idea, noticed it was useful, we incorporated that. Um, the Shine Delgarno and Primno box, that was known. Uh, we just said, well, that's going to make a difference, let's see how, how it helps out. So the lesson here is it's smart encoding, smart feature selection, knowing more about your problem um, and using those can make a real, real difference to performance. And that using sort of the naive approach, which I showed you before, um, which was just this you know, scan over a base, nine base window, um, really gives you pretty miserable results. And if, if we just simply used the simple hammer of, of neural nets for gene prediction, this is about as far as we could go. And we could have tried to use deep neural nets and we could have used um, all the latest tools that anyone's described and we would probably still get the same performance, which is pretty bad. So this, again, just to highlight that using and, and reframing your problem uh, can, can lead to dramatic improvements uh, to the performance. So what we have now is um, a neural net program written in pure Python. Um, we've also done this in, in R. Um, and um, what you can do now, I guess, really is um, use the time Probably it looks like we've got almost uh, 45, 15 minutes to, to run through the lab. So I'll, I'll briefly uh, give you some guidance about the lab. Um, again, you can go to um, the GPAN code repository, which is in module six, uh, describes um, all of the tools. Uh, we have both the Python and the R. Um, 
it's a long program, almost a thousand lines in Python. So it might take you a little bit of time if you want to understand the code, uh, but hopefully the, the slides have given you a bit of an outline. Um, this is complicated. So if you want to be able to upload the data, uh, it's not a single file upload. Uh, there are six files to upload. Um, these have to be done in order to be able to run the program. Once you've uploaded all of the data, then you can run uh, from the runtime. And you can also um, run all. Uh, you can uh, enter a length between any number of 10,000 to 50,000 nucleotides. You can choose a minimum ORF length, and then you can collect and view the results. Uh, you can go to different cells. Um, and you can change um, how long um, you, your ORF needs to be. Uh, you can enter a, a value in terms of uh, the limit for the genome. Um, in this case, we're not going to try and use the entire genome, so we suggest you use something between 1% um, and 30%. Uh, we also have other exercises where you can play around with playing, looking at different cells um, and um, removing, in this case, the code on usage frequencies, um, numbers, and see how that um, accuracy uh, for the predictions increases or decreases. Uh, you can select and deselect other features to see what, what happens, try and find out which ones make the most difference. Um, we can also change the SD start and end locations. This is the Shine Delgarno sequence. So you can rerun that, see how that changes, and how that perhaps improves or decreases overall performance. 